Hey, this is Pastor Ian of Plus Life Church, and we're so excited that you found this resource, and we pray that it blesses you and edifies you in your own walk with God. Listen, we want to remind you that this is a supplement and doesn't replace your own time in God's Word, nor does it replace actual church. So if you're not plugged into a local body of Christ, we invite you to come join us for worship at Plus Life. All the information is in the description box below. Know that you are loved, you are loved, you are loved. God bless. Go ahead and turn to someone to your right or to your left or behind you and tell them the title of my sermon this morning, The Apostles' Teaching. The Apostles' Teaching. Well, it is the new year, 2023, and uh, we're glad that everyone here, who is ever here in our, in our midst and also watching, on, watching online with us can join us for the first uh, worship service of the year. As uh, we usually do at the first of the year, we start off the year with a, a, a vision casting series, a series where we will normally look at the mission and vision of Plus Life Church and re reinforce that in our minds as we go and embark into the new year. And uh, usually we'll look at the three R's of Plus Life Church, reach, revolve, reflect, but this year we're going to be doing a little bit, we're going to do something a little bit different and look at rather the, the mission of the early church, the first church that we just read about in the book of Acts and see what their mission was, what they were about, what drove them and how they went about the church uh, affairs. I always find it interesting that churches, Christians, are often pragmatic. We see what works in other communities and other churches, and we try to apply that into our, uh, into our community, into our setting. Some churches have, uh, they call it church merch, where they have clothing and branding on clothing, uh, on, their, on their clothes, and maybe that's something we can apply. Or maybe we see, oh, some churches have sports ministries, Maybe that's something we can do as well. And some churches have greeters in the parking lot. Maybe that's something we can uh, have as well. And it, we are, the mindset is, it worked for them, maybe it'll work for us as well. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I think sometimes we have to go to a more trusted source, especially when it comes to the growth of the church and propagating the gospel, reaching the lost. Some modern-day churches have taken to reaching the lost by applying more worldly things into their services and, and connecting with the world that way, maybe playing some more secular music in order to be more relatable to the people of the world. And some churches have even taken to affirming sin just to be inclusive or, or to, to allow for worldviews, ideologies from, from secular uh, philosophies to infiltrate their, their pulpits, just, again, for the purpose of being more relatable to the lost, to be, the, to be more welcoming, so, so to speak, to the lost and attract unbelievers. And oftentimes the result of that is, sure, you'll see some, some growth, you'll see some members added, but you'll oft, oftentimes also see the, the sacred uh, being uh, degraded. And you'll see many times wolves coming in in sheep's clothing and taking advantage of real believers. And therefore, we, all of that to say, we need to be wary of of the things that we adapt, the, the, the kind of traditions, practices that we, we want to apply to our community. And fortunately for us, we have a trusted source, a trusted example of what we can take and what we can and, and take from and practices that we can apply to our community. And that is from the example of the early church, the first church in the book of Acts. What I love about what it describes as church in the book of Acts is that biblically and historically speaking, the growth of the church was not because they adapted worldly things into their worship services, not because they, they, they acted and behaved and taught and sang songs that was more palatable to the world, but it was because they were wholly set apart from the rest of the world. They were countercultural to what was going on in their, in, their, in their first century Jewish Hellenistic culture society. And what we read in, in the book of Acts 1 and chapter 1 and verse 2 is it describes how this, the early church really 
What they did was they devoted themselves to four things, and we saw it in our passage. The apostles' teachings, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And as a result, all unbelievers around them saw that there was something different, something unique about this community, and out of curiosity, brought them in, and they heard the gospel, and they believed, and it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There is no gimmick, there is no worldly music, there is no uh, presentation, there is no pastor in skinny jeans. It was just simply the gospel and the lives that were changed by it. That's what we're looking at this series. What did the early church practice, those four specific practices that set them apart, that made them counter-cultural? That's the title of our series, by the way. That, that made them distinct from the rest of society and the rest of the world. So the goal for our series is to examine those four practices, those, those things that the early church devoted themselves to so that we can pragmatically apply it to our own church, but also into our individual lives in order that we might see growth spiritually. So, we, so, so that we too can answer the call to be a counterculture church. One that lets our light shine to all men that who, those who see it would, might, that would, would glorify God and believe in the gospel. My hope is that we would devote ourselves to these practices just like the early church. What's interesting is this idea, this idea of devoted themselves. The word devotion in the, old, in the original Greek, it means to persist, to persevere in, to continue steadfast in. To continue to do something with intense effort despite circumstance and difficulty. That's what devotion means. It's a perseverance to something. You see, any real growth, whether it corporately or individually, we, to, to, for us to be counterculture to, uh, counter to the rest of the world, we have to persist. And that persistence will oftentimes mean that we will be in friction with the rest of the world. We'll, we'll see that we need to, in order to, be, to, to persist in the things of God, oftentimes we are going against the things of society, the cultural norms around us. But that's what is necessary to be, a, to be counter-cultural. counter-cultural. Counter-cultural means to, that we cannot compromise on these things. Even when difficulty arises, even when pressure from the world arises and, and we, are, we are threatened with to, to be ostracized from our friends and family, we are to be persistent, devoted to the things of God, even to the practices that we'll see and study in this series. You know, excuse me, uh, I, you know, I, I don't watch too, many, uh, too much sports on TV, uh, mainly because I don't uh, I don't know what time those, those sports go, the shows go on, and, and, and I don't have much time either, but I do watch a lot of uh, sports documentaries on, on Netflix, and especially when it comes to like basketball and stuff, especially when, when it talks about the greats, right? Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, and, and then you'll, you have some great documentaries on Netflix, The Last Dance, and The Redeemed Team, you should check those out if you ever have the chance. And, but what I've noticed in, in those documentaries what separates the, the Michael Jordans and, and, the, and the Kobe Bryants from, say, the, the LeBron James, for example, right? I know, controversial, uh, is their dedication, their devotion to the sport, to the game. It's interesting, in, in those documentaries, you see how behind the scenes, they're very uncompromising in their devotion to the sport. When the other team members are out partying, they're in the gym and they're practicing, when the other team members are done practicing, they're still at it. They're, they're going in hours upon hours just to be the best at the game. Their determination and their devotion, their uncompromising devotion to the sport is what made those guys great athletes. And at the same time, that's the, that's the level of devotion that is required of believers if we want to see growth in our community, whether corporately or individually, whether numerically or spiritually. This, this, uh, it's the start of the new year. Again, it's the first service of, of the year. And, and, of course, I'm sure many of us have gone or come into this new year with New Year's resolutions. Anyone have New Year's resolutions? No one has New Year's resolutions. Everyone is perfect. 
Amen, praise God. Why are you even doing church, right? But I'm sure everyone has some resolutions that you've made, that you, that changes that you want to make as we enter into the new year. And, and maybe some of you have resolutions revolving around your spiritual walk with God, maybe to be devoted to God's word more, to, have, to spend more time in prayer, to maybe church attendance even, to be involved more in church. Well, it's going to take persistence and perseverance, a devotion for that change to actually happen. Don't be like all those people who say, I'm going to start working out in 2024, and then one month later, their gym membership is not being utilized, right? It takes perseverance, persistence, devotion for things to change, to happen. And the first thing that we're going to be looking at, the thing that the early church was very much devoted to, was the apostles' teaching, the apostles' teachings. And, of course, this, this idea of following this and their, them being devoted to this made them um, countercultural to the society around them. And a good question to ask is, how? Why was it that, why was it that the, the teachings of the apostles um, made them countercultural? Well, just to sort of preface this a bit, uh, the apostles' teachings, why they were dedicated to this specifically last week, by the way, we talked about in Matthew chapter 16 that sort of controversial passage of Peter's confession when he declares uh, before the Lord that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we talked about how there's a lot of controversy with that passage, especially when revolving around the Roman Catholic Church, and they're using that as, as uh, validity to the papacy's authority over the church. And Of course, that stems from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, when Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, as we unpacked last week, we understand that what Jesus is getting at is that those with the same confession that Peter confessed in that moment that that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God, that's who Christ is going to build his church upon. Not just Peter, but even the rest of the apostles and any of the other believers to come. And we see that even in 1 Peter when, when Peter says to believers that you are living stones. Similar to how Christ called him a rock, you too are living stones. All of that to say, there is a notion that we see throughout Scripture that the apostles of Jesus Christ, the twelve, were in fact foundations, pillars to the early church. And if it wasn't for sort of the, the, the years that the, the Roman Catholic Church had abused sort of that, that authority of the papacy and, and made it more of a taboo topic to discuss, I think it, it's, it, it would have come natural, naturally to think that the apostles were in fact foundations of the church, pillars of the early church. In fact, the early reform was generally thought of them just as that. They never thought of them otherwise. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So in this passage, the Apostle Paul is affirming that, yes, Jesus is the head of the church, the the one who has all and complete authority. He's also the cornerstone. But on top of that, the foundations are the apostles as well. And I think that's important for our our understanding in, in, in what we're studying this morning because oftentimes, first of all, where the problem comes is that when we preach the authority of the apostles being passed down to another bishop, to another pastor, to another head of a church. That's, I think, where the issues come, whether you're you know, coming from the Catholic tradition or even from a Protestant tradition that still says that there's still apostles and whatnot. There are no living apostles today, no one with their similar authority, no one with their similar gifting that can summon signs and wonders to be evidence and validate the legitimacy of the church. There are no living apostles today right? There's, there's very specific qualifications for that that we see in Scripture. And the, it, but yet, it, despite all that, the apostles are still an important foundation to our faith this day, and even establishing the church back in the early church. 
Because what we have today is the legacy of the apostles found in the Bible, in the New Testament. All of their teaching, all of their focus, their motivations, their views, their perspectives in their time is recorded in the New Testament. What we call the teaching of the apostles, or the apostles' teaching that we're looking at today, is really what we have in the New Testament. It gives us modern-day believers a first-hand account of what the apostles were teaching in the first century. And, of course, not just the apostles, because the source of their teaching is from Christ. What we'll see throughout our study and throughout this series is the stuff that they're practicing, whether it's their teachings, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, to the prayers, really it's all stemming from what Christ taught them. What they learned in that three-year ministry of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is the legacy of the apostles, a compilation of all their teachings. And so what we're looking at this morning is uh, specifically what were the apostles teaching? We're talking about the apostles' teaching. What is it that they were instructing people in, the new believers in? Two things, only two things this morning. Devotion to the gospel and devotion to holiness. Devotion to the gospel and devotion to holiness. Let's look at our passage real quick here again. Our passage, by the way, and just in context, takes place on the day of Pentecost. Rather, Peter comes up and he preaches to the masses and he, he takes them on this exegetical journey from, from Genesis all the way up to Christ, telling them how Christ is at the center of it all. And then when we get to our passage in verse 38, he says, uh, towards the conclusion of his sermon, he says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Then, in verse 40, it says, With many words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Right there, what we just read, verse 38 to 39, is Paul preaching the gospel. And then in verse 40, is his call to holiness, to save themselves from a crooked generation. Let's look at the first point here, devotion to the gospel. Paul was, or rather, Peter was preaching the devotion to the gospel. It's interesting, growing up, I grew up in a Baptist church, as most of you know, and I've always heard this word, the gospel, it's a very Christianese term, right? And um, this idea of the gospel, at least growing up, I always thought it to be simply the story of Jesus and the, and the call for unbelievers to repent and say the sinner's prayer. And it, I always saw it as sort of just, just uh, uh, something to tell unbelievers and a part of, uh, of Christianity, but, but that's, that's it. But I remember when, when Plus Life first started, when we were just a Bible study group in the basement, and I met these guys for the first time, and the elders of Plus Life, and they, they mentioned that the vision of the church is to, to see lives changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was kind of mind-boggling to me, because I was like, why, do you, why is your vision of Plus Life, why, why, is, why is your vision to, all about the gospel? Why is that your vision? It shouldn't be like, study God's word, or... Or, or, or do good things, or whatever it is, right? Whatever things that we want to do as a Christian, why is that the vision? Why is the gospel at the heart of the vision of plus life? And, you know, thankfully, as, as I fellowshiped with them and I studied with them, pushed deeper in my own faith and my own understanding of things, really, really what I've come to understand and conclude is that the gospel is not just for unbelievers, it's also for believers, the gospel is not just for unbelievers, it's also for believers. Because what you come to realize is that the gospel is everything in the Christian faith. Absolutely everything. The only reason why we meet here and gather, why we can pray and know that we are heard by a holy God, why we can have hope for change, why we can know that we are forgiven, why sin has no hold on us, no claim on us, why we can pursue holiness and know that we can actually achieve it, why tomorrow is not so dark and why today is more bearable and why our sins are long dead in our past. It's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why we can stand here, or sit here rather, and, and, and fellowship together and worship together. 
The gospel is what separates us from the doctrine of demons that other world religions propagate. Paul says in Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And we know that verse and we claim that verse, but oftentimes we lose sight of that word salvation because, because salvation is not, in this passage, is not just talking about conversion. Salvation in this passage that Paul is talking about is, is the whole process of it, the whole journey from justification, sanctification to glorification. The gospel is the power of God for salvation throughout the entire process, the entire Christian journey. The moment that Christ saves us, that we convert and put our faith in Jesus Christ, to the in-between where we are being sanctified day by day to become more like Christ, to the eventual glorification, new heavens and new earth, where, you, where we die on this earth, where Christ returns, whatever comes first. And all of that is prefaced, all of that is empowered by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see that in the early church, that is the entire motivation of the apostles. Shortly after our passage, Peter preaches again to, this time to the, the Jewish council, to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4. He says uh, in Acts chapter, 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 19 to 20, But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. What they have seen and heard would eventually become the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What they were preaching is their entire experience in the three-year ministry of Jesus Christ. That's what they were preaching. What they were preaching was the Gospel. The apostles live with this sense of urgency, this immovable, uncompromising resolve to proclaim and live out the Gospel. And of course, to natu naturally, if you do that, if you follow that, what happens is that you will be countercultural. What happens is that the world will see you differently. But the apostles could not help themselves but preach the gospel. Despite even, again, there, what happens after this is that Peter and John get sent to prison because they would not stop preaching the gospel. But they could not help themselves but to speak about this life-altering experience that they had with Jesus. I mean, if, if you're out on the streets today, and, you know, God forbid you were hit by a semi-truck, your life would be irrevocably changed, right? You wouldn't walk away from that and, and be the same. Well, how much more after witnessing firsthand the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God that resulted in your, the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation from the wrath of God, and the promise of eternity. Your life wouldn't be the same. They, the apostles themselves saw the risen Savior. They saw Him. They, that, that was the, the reality that they were living in. There was no death threat. There was no persecution. There was no measure of suffering that could silence them after that. Their life was irrevocably changed by the gospel they, that, they per, that they personally lived and witnessed with the Savior. And really, it should be the same for us. One of the great evidence, evidences of, of the validity and authority and even the power of the gospel in, in modern-day churches today is really the impact that it has on people. The impact that it has on people who did not see Jesus firsthand, who, who didn't live 2,000-odd years ago, yet still has their lives irrevocably changed. And you're evidence of that. If you're sitting here in our midst today, your lives are evidence of the power of the gospel to change lives even today. Paul puts it this way. Think about your life a moment. Think about your life prior to coming to Christ. Paul puts it this way. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 he says this, and you were dead. I love that. It's just very, very frank, the Apostle Paul. Uh, and you were dead. He doesn't say you're broken. He doesn't say you were weak. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. 
in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul is saying, listen, you weren't just hit by a semi-truck, you were dead on arrival. You were already deceased. You were a rotten corpse, born without innocence, living and thinking and following after the ways of the world and the enemy. And then in verse 4, this great hope that we have, the great reality that we now live in. He says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's the reality that believers live in today. That we were brought from death to life. That's a big deal. That's a life-altering, universe-changing deal, a reality that we live in. That is, there is greater power displayed in the conversion of a dead sinner than in the creation of the universe. That's the reality of it. Therefore, it ought to leave us irrevocably changed. If this has no impact on us, if this doesn't humble us, if this doesn't grieve us, if it doesn't bring joy to our hearts, if it doesn't strike us to the heart, perhaps it's a sign that we lack some understanding or maybe a grasp on on the reality of our salvation. And, And that's okay because Christians are often forgetful creatures. That's why we preach on the same topics over and over again because we have spiritual amnesia oftentimes. They say that after a sermon is preached, it only lasts in people's brains for three days, right? Well, that's my time frame, and I have to preach the same again or the same topic again next week. But, but it's okay because that's why we have the apostles' teachings. Why the apostles' teachings is, was, a necessary, uh, was necessary for the church in, 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 the, uh, in the book of Acts, but also for us today. It's why we see the, in our passage even the devotion of the disciples, the believers, to go to the temple and to go to the synagogues every day, day by day. Why? Well, it's because there, in the synagogues, at least in that time, was the only place that you could hear the word of God where the scrolls of the Old Testament, Old Testaments were. And then, as evidence in Peter's speech in the sermon in Acts chapter 2, what they did with what they heard from those synagogues, from, those, from the manuscripts of the Old Testament, is that they would exegete them in light of the gospel, with the gospel at the center, with Jesus at the center, and relating it all back to Christ. All for the purpose of confirming and reminding other believers, and even themselves, about the gospel that they believe. Similarly, our devotion to the gospel should always lead us back to the word of God. Study it, to meditate it, to to know its truth, to hear its truth day to day. Something Something that oftentimes we need to do is to preach the gospel to ourselves. You know, something big that I've seen online and social media lately is is sort of the psychological uh, or, or yeah psychological movement of, of you know the self talk. You have to motivate yourself. If you want to go to the gym, you have to you know tell yourself to go to the gym. All this self talk. Well, it's nothing new. We see that all in the book of well, we see that all throughout the Psalms, right? When David says, "Oh my soul, why are you downcast? Look to the hills." Where our salvation comes from. That's David's self-talk. Reminding himself of the truths of who God is and, and, and God's faithfulness. And well, in the same way, oftentimes as believers, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves on a day-to-day basis. And where we can see the gospel, hear the gospel, and examine the truths of it is, of course, in the Bible. The revealed word of God. It is the only way to fully grasp and understand and revel in the gospel and to really learn how to apply it into our daily life. Maybe some application here, right? Uh, How how do we be devoted to the gospel like the early church? First and foremost, you need to believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. 
I usually leave an invitation towards the end of the sermon for, for unbelievers, but really, there's no better time to start believing the gospel than now, the moment. The rest of this stuff won't matter to you unless you believe the gospel. God sent his son to die for sinful humanity, and our response to that is to believe, have faith in him for our salvation, to get right with God. Believe the gospel. Secondly, you need to study the gospel. And studying the gospel means that you study scripture. And you need to read the Bible. Oftentimes, I think when we read the Bible, when we approach the Bible we, to study, we, we have ourselves at the center of our study. Okay, God, what are you going to speak to me about? What do, you, what, what do you have to say about my situation, my circumstance in life? What is it that, that, that I can get from, from this about what you want to say to me? What is it, Lord? That's oftentimes our mentality when studying the Bible. But reality is, the focal point of the Bible, all, in all of its entirety, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. He is at the center of everything. It's not you. And so when we study the Bible, when we read the Bible, we need to have a gospel-centered mindset as we read it. When we read the life of Christ, the life of, and conduct and the teachings of the apostles, what developed out of their devotion to the gospel, we need to read that. Even in the Old Testament, we need to read how, how, how all of that, in, what that happens in the Old Testament is leading up to the advent of the Savior. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 to 11 says, this is Paul teaching, or rather uh, writing to Timothy. He says, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Paul is... is equating his life to lessons for Timothy. Paul is saying to Timothy, like, look at my example, everything that I've gone through, everything I've suffered through, my conduct, my, my lifestyle, all my teachings. That's part of the apostles' teachings, the, thing, the references that we have today to look back upon. Then in verse 14, Paul continues, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and, what have, and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, what scripture is, is Paul talking about here, by the way? The Old Testament, yes, that's already at hand, but there's also great evidence, historically speaking, that the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, were already circulating in the early church by this time. This is uh, Paul's last letter that he ever writes, Second Timothy, right before he's executed. And what we see, at least in the historical manuscripts, is that the Gospels were already around. And the early church were already considering them as Holy Scripture. Now, and of course, in addition to that, there was the letters of Paul that was being passed around as well. That's what Paul's talking about. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good the call is to study the apostles' teachings. And where we see the apostles' teachings is in the New Testament, is in the Word of God. So we need to believe the gospel, study the gospel, and also live the gospel. Live the gospel. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We must live in a way that does not put to shame, contradict, or misrepresent the gospel that we believe in, the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, if we are being unforgiving, but we are proclaiming a gospel that forgives, that is misrepresenting the gospel. If we, are being, if we are being unloving and we say that you know, Christ died because he loves us, that is contradictory to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are enabling sin when the gospel calls sinners to repent, that is misrepresenting the gospel. We must live out our lives in a way that represents the gospel 
well. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk more about that in a moment here. But as we even see in our, in our passage here in Philippians chapter 1, Paul's call is to strive together, side by side, in the faith for the gospel. The part of living out the gospel is living, in, living it out together, in unity as the body of Christ, in fellowship with one another. And we'll, what we'll see throughout the next couple of weeks in our study, in our series, is that everything that the early church did was for the edification of the body. They sold all their possessions and everything, everything they had in order to meet the needs of fellow believers. There was a great generosity and hospitality being demonstrated in the early church because that's what happens when you live out the gospel. Lastly, when we want to live out the gospel, as I already mentioned, there is a need for repentance. There is a need for repentance. The gospel requires Repentance. Verse 38 of our main passage, Acts chapter 2, Paul, or rather Peter, says flat out, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Repentance is crucial to the call of being, uh, to, to, to the call of being a countercultural church. Or even to the call of, of responding to the gospel. If we break down the gospel in its, its sort of just in its plain, plainly, right? We start with God. God is holy. He is the creator. He is the highest authority over everything made an entire universe that is good. Then we go to man, man who fell in the Garden of Eden, man who has a sinful nature, man who is considered rebels, cosmic treason, committed cosmic treason to a holy God. The only thing that we deserve being the wrath of God, death, hell. Excuse me. But God, being loving, as we said, sends his son, Jesus Christ, to save us, to die for our sins, to, to pay for the sins that we should have paid for, to die the death that we should have died, so that we could have access to the Father, so that we could be forgiven of our sins. So God, man, Christ, and then the last part of that is our response, our human responsibility, to, as the Bible says, to believe. To believe. To believe in the, the, the finished work of Jesus Christ. To believe that his sacrifice on the cross was sufficient to save us. But in that belief, what naturally comes after that is repentance. Because if we truly believe that God is holy and that we are sinful and that Christ had to come and die for our sins then the natural response isn't, well, now I can love God more. The first natural response isn't, well, now I can live the best life I can live and be more confident and be more proactive and whatever else it is. The first natural response is to say, God, I am a sinner and I need salvation. That is the first, repentance is the first expression of faith. If we truly believe the gospel, if it truly has struck us to our, to our core, if, it's truly, if our sins have truly grieved us, if the knowledge that Christ suffered on the cross because of our sins is truly real to us, then repentance naturally comes. The Bible talks much about confessing sin. Confession in the original Greek literally just means to agree with the charges. To agree with the crime. I'm confessing. Uh, the, the Bi- it's like this. The Bible says you are a sinner. You, you committed cosmic treason to God. When we confess our sins to God, it's simply saying, I agree. I agree. I accept the charges. I am guilty as charged. That's confession. And so uh, the right and first response to that is Repentance. Repentance demonstrates that we truly understand the depths of sin and the heights of grace. What has afforded us a right relationship with God. <coughs> and just a simple definition of repentance, again, is you're going one way, you're following your way, you're following the world's way, the, the passions of your flesh, as we read from Ephesians chapter 2. And to repent is to go in the complete and opposite direction, to follow after Christ. 
Now, when we devote ourselves to the gospel and we repent, what naturally happens is that we are no longer living like the world. We are no longer in line with the desires and the ways of the world, and the mentalities of the ways, the thinking of the world. And what happens naturally is holiness. And this is why the second part to the apostles' teaching is a devotion to holiness. Holiness, I know, is a big word and sometimes a daunting word, but in its simplest form, it simply means to be set apart, to be distinct. Essentially, what countercultural means to be distinct from the world, to be set apart from it. Again, in our passage, verse 40, it says, And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from the crooked generation. Obviously, Peter is not talking about saving ourselves in a spiritual sense. That word crooked generation puts in some context there. He's using a very specific phrase and specific wording here. That, that phrase, crooked generation, actually comes from the Song of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, right before, uh, right, right before Moses passes away and he, he gives them the leadership mantle to Joshua. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, when Moses is talking about the earth and the people of the earth or humanity itself, he says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5, they have dealt corruptly with him, talking about Man's relationship with God. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. And I think this is an important context because really it tells how, how, how Moses and even the apostles viewed the rest of the world. The unbelieving world. It sets up why the church is different. If we obey the word of God, then naturally we are disobeying the, word, the way of the world. You're not following after the world. Paul puts it this way, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the, world, to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul here is also referencing the Old Testament, Moses and the Israelites, the Israelites who grumbled in the wilderness and refused to follow God. Hence why Paul says here, do, do all things without grumbling or disputing. What he's getting is, by, is that by choosing to follow the apostles, the, the teachings of the apostles, the word of God, naturally we will be set apart. We will be, we'll be opposite of the norms of culture and society. The apostles' teachings, we even see this idea of devotion to holiness in, in the first uh, in, in, in sort of the first council of the apostles in, in the book of Acts, the first Jerusalem council, when there was a question about whether or not Gentiles should be circumcised. Circumcision was a sign for the Israelites to be set apart, to be holy from the rest of the pagan cultures in their day, back in the Old Testament. And so um, the circumcision party, which was a group of Pharisees that converted to Christianity in the early church, had this, this argument with Paul asking or, or, or saying that the Gentiles had to be circumcised as well. And so Paul has to go back to the apostles in Jerusalem and they had to hold a council and see what is it that we want to tell the, tell the, to tell the Gentiles. And what we get is in Acts chapter 15, Verse 28 to 29, they send a letter to the Gentile churches. They say, for it, is, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay, on, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. That's their letter to the rest, to the Gentile churches. What are they getting at? They're getting at holiness. It's not about, holiness is not just about these external practices. Really, it's a conviction. It's a resolve. And that's what this passage is getting at. The conviction that in order to follow the will of God, in order to follow the word of God, we need to get away from these explicit practices of the world. 
the pagan practices, even the idolatrous practices of the world. Hence the, the, the call to, to stay away from, from things offered to idols, from blood sacrifices, from things that have been strangled, to sexual immorality. These were all pagan practices. What Peter and the other apostles were getting at is that, hey, if your conviction is to follow Christ, then don't practice these things that follow after demons, the doctrines of demons. Don't associate with them. Holiness starts with a conviction. That's the point. Maybe practically for us, we have to be oftentimes reminded that it's not the externals that make us holy. There are many church traditions that require its members to just wear suits and ties. That women have to wear dresses because this is what makes people think that you're holy, right? No one here is wearing suits and ties, I don't think. I guess none of us are holy here. That's not the case. It's not just externals. Holiness is not just externals. Again, it starts with conviction. Uh, it starts with a, a, a renewed thinking that we are no longer part of this world in terms of its, its culture, in terms of its, its societal norms, in terms of its desires and the ways of thinking. Renewed thinking results in renewed living. That's where it starts. That's where holiness starts. Now also, in addition to that, I think oftentimes when you think about holiness, we associate, we equate it to perfection. At least in a worldly sense or in a worldly standard, holiness means perfection. Perfection means sinlessness. That's not the case in Scripture. Holiness is not measured by whether or not you sin. Although it's part of it. The result of holiness is that you flee from sin. But even the word perfect or perfection in, in the New Testament, teleos, in the original Greek, means that something that is being brought to completion, grown to maturity, completeness, uh, something that is not lacking anything. That's what perfection means in the New Testament. And you see in the Gospels when Jesus says, be perfect as, as your Father in heaven is perfect. It simply means not lacking anything. Be whole in your thinking, in your understanding especially in the context of that passage. It does not mean without sin. Even the Apostle Paul writes in Romans how uh, he, he writes his outcry of, oh, this wretched man I am, who's going to save me from this sinful flesh? And he says, thanks be to God who sends Christ Jesus our Lord. You can read in the New, in, in, as well in the New Testament about Peter's own struggles even after him being this great apostle and uh, one of the founding members of the early church, how he falls to the sin of partiality because of that circumcision party. So, all of that to say, the reality that we live in is that we live in, in fallen flesh that is prone to temptation, prone to sin, even though we have a new nature because of the Holy Spirit, because of our salvation. The reality is we'll have some good days and some bad days where we stumble and fall and days that we'll have victory over sin. But sin will not leave our, our presence until we get to our glorified bodies and the new heaven, the new earth. We will still be prone to sin. So we cannot achieve sinlessness in this life. We must, we must not put that standard upon ourselves. We must seek to be holy and set apart and kill sin, yes, but to set that standard for us is trying to achieve something that is not attainable in this life. And the reality of it, what we see in Scripture, is that even when we fall, even when we stumble, even in our sin, there's a way to be holy even in that be set apart from the rest of the world. What I mean by this is that we have this example in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul's follow-up letter to the Corinthian church was going through a big um, upheaval and there was sin in their midst and all of these things. And That's 1 Corinthians. Now 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul follows up. He says in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 9, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, where you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. 
For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that you that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. See, the reality is if we believe, if we agree with the gospel, we, would, we will hate sin. Because we all understand that that sin in our lives is what put us in odds with God, put us in rebellion towards God, is what nailed Christ to the cross. That's the sin in our life. And we can't stand it. So a true believer will, will desire to kill sin in their lives, will pursue holiness. Yet even, in, even in, in, in that pursuit of holiness, there are times where we will stumble and we will fall, but what makes us different from the world, what sets us apart, where holiness takes place, even in our failings, in our stumblings, in our sin, is how we rise up, as how we get back up from that sin. Where the world will wallow in sin, the church will rise from it. Believers will rise from it. Where the world will, 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 will celebrate sin, the church will condemn it. Where the world will, will hide sin, the church will expose it. Where the, the world will cancel those they consider sinners, the church will forgive. And it's not just... It's not just different in how we deal with the sin in our lives. But it's also how we deal with suffering, how we deal with our finances, with our desires, with how we raise our kids, with our political views. Holiness means that we are completely and wholly set apart from the rest of the world in everything, in all those categories. And what is the end goal of it all? What is the pursuit of holiness? To be more like Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians as well, chapter 3, verse 18, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Here, holiness is measured by the degree in which we resemble Christ rather than the world. That's what holiness is. It is, degree, it is measured by the degree in which we resemble Christ rather than the world. Maybe some application here as we, as we end our time. On matters of personal sin, how do you deal with it in your life? You wallow in your failures. Do you continue in your sin? Do you celebrate it? Maybe you're, are, you, are you numb or apathetic to the sin in your life? Are you, are you tolerant to the sin in your life? Or do you seek to, seek to kill it? Be rid of it? You go to whatever lengths, whatever degree, just to, just to remove whatever it is that is causing you to stumble and fail God. When you look at others, other people and, and their struggles, their sin in their life, are you enabling sin? Are you holding it over their heads in judgment? Are you using it as a weapon to belittle, to degrade them, to question their character. The Bible preaches forgiveness. In our pursuit of holiness, are your desires in line with the world? Or is it in line with, the, with God's? Do you echo the rhetoric of, of society? Do you view topics and issues and your finances in a way that is honoring and glorifying to God and is in line with Scripture? Do you speak, do you conduct yourself or behave yourself in a way that is fitting someone who has been saved and saved by the gospel and is a representative of it? The end of the matter is that if we want to grow, if we want to be a countercultural church, if we want to grow as individuals, as believers, then we need to be devoted to the apostles' teachings, which is the word of God what we find in Scripture. We need to be devoted to the gospel, and as a result of being devoted to the gospel, we'll, the natural outcome of that is that we'll also be devoted to holiness, 
who want to be a countercultural church, we need to put the gospel at the forefront of our entire life in every aspect of 